Hello and welcome to the latest Manufacturing Management Live panel. Um, I'm Chris Beck, the editor of Manufacturing Management. Uh, today we're going to be talking about sustainability in manufacturing um, in the wake of the government's recently announced industrial decarbonisation strategy, which sets out a plan for um, industry to reach net zero emissions in the, the next couple of decades. Uh, we're going to be discussing how important this is and also how realistic it is um, for industry. Obviously, decarbonisation and the push towards net zero has been on the agenda for many years, and sustainability is central to the government's post-pandemic recovery plans. It's also becoming increasingly important for business leaders, not just in manufacturing, but across all sectors. So it's therefore very timely that such an important document has been released, outlining the steps needed um, to get towards net zero by the government's target of 2050. Uh, but what impact is this going to have, and how can manufacturers um, get on the road towards net zero um, in time. To help me um, explore all that, I'm joined by a panel of experts. First up, we've got um, Bridget Amoruso, uh, Energy and Climate Change Lead at Make UK. Uh, she's joined by David Oliver, a Senior Energy Consultant at Inenco. And finally, we have David Picton, Senior Vice President of Sustainability at Alchemist. And thank you all for um, being here today. Bridget, we'll come to you first, if you'd like to introduce yourself, but also what has been the uh, reaction um, from Make UK and, and your members to the, to the strategy that was announced um, a few days ago? Thank you, Chris. And uh, yes, I'm uh, Bridget Amoruso. So Make UK is the largest manufacturing uh, uh, national body for manufacturers. We represent um, 2.7 people <laughs> employed. Um, in that sector. Um, and uh, yeah, so we have uh, sister companies in um, Scotland and Ireland, and we actually are um, directly in touch with 5,000 of them. So we have quite a good representation. So concerning the industrial decarbonization strategy, um, yes, I think it's very, very welcome. It actually Finally, um, I think it's the first strategy really, which provides an indicative pathway, which is very welcome. And it, I think it does provide um, a certain degree of certainty for industry with the right signals. But of course, um, the devil is in the detail and there are uh, some points which um, will need refining and discussion and, and can be quite worrying as well. But I'll, I'll stop there because it's a very general statement, but I think really well received in general. Thanks, Bridget. David Picton, if we come to you, um, come to you next. How have you seen, well, first of all, what's your reaction to, uh, to the, the sustainability um, document, uh, the, the plan announced last week? And also how have you seen sustainability um, change in terms of the way industry perceives it in in recent years yeah thanks chris uh, yeah good morning good afternoon um it's i'm david picton i'm the senior vice president of sustainability at alchemist we're a, we're a technology company we're providing software and services for risk management in the main uh, working in areas like health safety uh, quality the environment uh, and now increasingly all wider responsible business um, so we're, although we're based in the uk and north america we're working with about forty thousand clients across the world so it's a proper cross-sector approach we've got and we can see uh, how that um the issues you raised are working across those various sectors and, and different geographies as well so as you said i think the, um, the the important point chris is that this is a cracking opportunity uh, i think that there's a lot of expectation of course there's a lot to do uh, as there should be i think but it is an incredible opportunity for particularly uk manufacturers i think um, to build their competitive advantage uh, and then to lead uh, a lot of not only the processes that we work with but the skills that we develop as well that, that are behind that um, I, I think this is important absolutely for the consumer agenda. Yeah, there's no question that choices are moving much more towards choosing um, sustainable products. Um, absolutely, that's got a direct link to cost. So the, the cost competitiveness, I think, of, of those products as well, because a, a good sustainable business tends to save money, actually, rather than cost money. Um, clearly, retailers uh, are moving this way. The, all of the retail supply chains are looking deeper into the impacts of their products and the way those products are more responsible for for not only consumers and end use, but also the, the, the broader reputation of brands. 
And we're seeing that backed up by investors as well, where there's increasingly a focus on the financial disclosures that investors are looking for. Uh, and of course, inevitably, a move towards the cost of capital. So there is a, a sort of green um, benefit, if you will, to, to manufacturers and, and all those looking to invest capital in uh, areas like that. I mean, just looking at the ISAs on offer at the moment for, for us as individuals, there are climate you know, green bond type ISAs that are doing extremely well and, and set to do even better ahead of uh, areas like COP26 later this year. So yeah, I think it's a cracking opportunity, this this strategy. And, and, and as we're no doubt going to talk about, there are some really practical moves that can be made that will bring out that competitive nature. Thank you very much. And, and David Oliver will come to you last. Just building on what David said there, um, what, what can manufacturers do to, you know, initial steps towards net zero? And obviously your reaction to uh, the sustainability um, announcement. Yeah, so, so I'm David Oliver, I'm a senior consultant at ENCO and I work in our solutions team who deal with carbon reporting, energy efficiency and environmental sustainability. And I suppose it's, it's not necessarily a new, you know, this, this was expected, it's been growing for the last couple of years. And we've seen, particularly in the areas like retail and properties, we've seen massive increases in the uh, sort of awareness of sustainability from our customers. And, and some of, the, some of them are setting very ambitious uh, targets for net zero carbon, you know, some as soon as 2030. So we are seeing massive increase in awareness and uh, importance of sustainability around the board table. Um, but obviously from the industrial sector's point of view, the biggest risk we see is of uh, what, what's nicely referred to as carbon leakage. And um, I'm sure we'll be talking about that later in today. <laughs> Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks, David. Um, a kind of general question for everyone, really. Um, again, both both David and indeed Bridget touched on the the kind of growing appetite, I suppose, for for sustainability, both you know from government, from industry itself, but also from um, from customers and from consumers. Do you think consumer attitudes um, have changed? Certainly, in the last year or so. I know, speaking as obviously as a consumer myself, I know that. I've become more aware of the, the kind of environmental impact of, of what I'm buying, whether that's online or, or from shops. Um, do you think that's something that's driving change within manufacturing? Manufacturers are having to respond to customer pressure from further down the chain, as, opposed, as well as pressure from above from, from government and, and policymakers. Mm. David P. I yeah, think you want to say. yeah, absolutely. I would absolutely agree. I, I think we see the evidence of it all around us in the shop floors. You know, so the consumer-related shop floors. You, you only have to see the move away from single-use plastics, for example, um, ways in which products are packaged in a different way. So all of these contribute to carbon footprints, of course. Um, people more aware of food miles, um, even beer miles, I've seen as well, which has <laughs> made me smile a little bit. Um, so I think the idea of investing in local economies has a double bounce of, of, of growth, but also then cutting down the carbon footprint footprint. People are looking closely at where their, their products have come from. Uh, they're looking at the impact that that will have had. And in a, in a very close to home little example for, you know, I took my daughter around, around the, the, the supermarket and, um, and we're stocking her up to go back to university. And the products she chose were different ones than I would have chosen. Um, so, she, you know, this new this new collection of consumers entering the workforce, entering the, the, uh, the display. It's true across fast moving consumer goods. I think it's true across big manufacturing. And you have to look at the growth of electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles as well to see, you know, exactly how this is working, um, you know, at, at a large manufacturing scale as well. Yeah, thank you. you, you uh, your connection is yeah. a little jumpy, but we got, we got yeah, most cool. of that there. Bridget, I'll come to you. Um, is there anything you'd like to, to, to add to what David Yes, I think there? certainly the younger generation seem to be um, a lot more aware but uh, there is still a lot of confusion um, amongst con consumers and that comes from you know for example recycling and the products you know are not yet ready for um, reuse and repair there's you know so I think the whole system is still quite confusing and I think still many consumers don't really grasp what net zero is actually so that's one thing but I particularly wanted to emphasize that the pressure is not just coming from government and policy um, who are maybe responsive to the public <laughs> demand 
uh, overall as a concept, but um, also uh, mainly to pressure from um, the supply chain, from within the supply chain, uh, particularly uh, OEMs who are uh, now uh, a larger company who now have to report on their carbon emissions and uh, under scope, scope three, although it's voluntary, they, they are actually asking their suppliers um, what they're doing in that respect. So I think uh, we see more and more the pressure coming from that um, and it will <coughs> work its way down the supply chain, which is, which is good. Definitely, David. Mm -hmm. Uh, Oliver, is there anything? Yes, sorry, I, I'd echo that. I mean, two years ago, most sustainability targets were based on scope one and scope two emissions, you know, the ones that you're directly responsible for. And what we're seeing now is people extending those targets into their supply chains. And I suppose one great example of this is in the public sector with the NHS. Uh, they were set targets last year to be net zero carbon for their own emissions by 2040, but they have to also ensure their supply chain is net zero carbon by 2045. And there's a lot of manufacturing that supplies to the NHS. So, but equally, we're all aware that it's very difficult to actually work out what the carbon content of products is. And in fact, that was one of the key things that came out of last week's announcement is this commitment to improve labeling of products to actually identify what the carbon content is. Hmm. Can I, Chris, can I echo and back that up? I think David's absolutely spot on there. I think that supply chain visibility issue is absolutely key uh, to what we're hearing. Um, I think we're also seeing a lot of work around the frameworks that, that back this up, publicly available standards, so PAS standards for carbon neutrality and for um, infrastructure carbon, for example. Uh, and we're also seeing this around a lot of the, the ISO standards for how to provide a framework for best practice that sits across all sectors and all, all geographies as well. So I think you know, David makes a really important point about supply chain visibility and data management within that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I mean, both David's there. You um, you kind of alluded to uh, kind of more more scrutiny of of, um, of emissions and, and sustainability throughout the supply chain. It's also something that Bridget um, Bridget mentioned. How, uh, for want of a better word, how intimidating could all this potentially be for, especially for smaller companies? You know that. They're struggling at the best, you know, especially at the moment, they're struggling with with day to day operations and suddenly they're having to you know, count their emissions, measure, measure even more, report on things. How uh, David Oliver, I guess, you know, you you work a lot with with manufacturers in a kind of consultancy setting. How what advice do you give them about um about knowing where to start, I suppose, when it comes to reporting on sustainability? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the first thing we do when we talk to customers about sustainability is get them to sit down and understand what it means to them, what it means to their business. You know, there's no sort of uh, one sustainability process fits everybody. You know, it's, it's different sectors have different uh, competition, different uh, types of uh, awareness of their customers. You know, plastics, for example, is very much now about people reducing the use of plastics and therefore the plastic suppliers have to be wary of, you know, using more recycled content and maybe even looking at alternative products. So there are some massive threats to the industries. Um, and of course, as I said before, one of the other threats is that if you're going to get taxed out of business in the UK, then obviously you move your production off, offshore. So of those are the sort of challenges. And, uh, yeah, but the reporting burden, you're quite right. You know, if you're a very small business, maybe one small factory, if you suddenly find yourself with huge amounts of reporting, that's proportionally a lot more expensive than for a big organisation who's doing it across a number of factories. Yes, Bridget, is this something you're you're hearing at all from Make UK members? Uh, yes, I think um, uh, the RSMEs um, need help. There's that's quite clear. But very interestingly, we've pulled them uh, just a few days ago, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, the despite the COVID and despite um, let's say the EU exit um, and all the difficulties associated. Um, the vast majority overwhelmingly said um, net zero was the long-term priority for them, which is very good news. Mm -hmm. So clearly, I think they have understood now, uh, they're understanding now, um, you know, that it is really important and it's going to be um, to their advantage. And we have seen with the COVID crisis how agile actually business can be. So, um, uh, yeah, so basically, uh, I think they can adapt quickly uh, and even produce different things if need be. 
Um, yeah. So what is going, what is slowing them down is actually access to funds and access to uh, skills. So we noticed that uh, <clears throat> funds, well, obviously they need funds to innovate or maybe um, change the equipment by a more digital digital or digitalize or <clears throat> innovate but uh, innovative equipment but also um, also to educate their board or um, yes uh, uh, not just the man at management level and also apprentices they want to uh, take in especially younger uh, uh, people who have you know um, digital skills more, uh, you know, for whom digital skills come more naturally. And that is a problem because there are very few apprentices at the moment. Um, yeah, there's a skills gap, definitely. Chris, can I uh, pick up on Brid Bridget's point there? I think it's, it's, it's an absolutely crucial point she makes about skills, because I think this is partly a once in a generation opportunity um, for uh, our, our manufacturers and, and for our wider industry as well. We've got a chance, I think, to build a next generation workforce uh, so that in practice could look at as simply as investing in, in low carbon degrees and apprenticeships, you know, uh, specific apprenticeships that are focused on introducing technologies in a very practical way. Um, you know, this is a a chance to take all of the work we've done on STEM over the last five or six years, uh, introduce that into a more diverse workforce, opened it to more diverse talent bases, introduced gender balance as well. So there's, there's, there's a whole wave of good work, work that's been done. But now we could see manufacturers sponsoring and working with universities to create these low carbon degrees. We could export those skills over the next few decades as well. And in that in that respect, we could lead a region and possibly even you know the, the world to become known, you know, as the home of low carbon thinking. Absolutely, yeah. I think I like I like the uh, the bold ambition there, David. I think it's a it's a it's a good thing to to aim for. We've we talk a lot about the skills the skills crisis and, and now is as good a time as any I suppose to, to kind of hit the reset button and, and look at how we how we want things to look in the future something Bridget mentioned as well was was kind of management buy-in and and board level understanding of of sustainability as a whole and, and some of the challenges around it David Oliver um, how can management how much more work needs to be done for management teams to, to kind of understand, especially again, going back to SMEs, you know, they've got a lot on their plate. How do we get through to, to the people running these factories that sustainability is, um, is really important and something they should be, should be focusing on? Although it does sound by Make UK's research that the message is starting to get through. You, David, you're on mute, I'm afraid. <laughs> Sorry, our, our biggest customers actually tend to have sustainability departments nowadays. You know, they've got many people doing the same job or, sorry, parts of the uh, same role. Um, and you, as you say, the big issues for the smaller companies where they've only got one person doing that job, because that job is becoming more and more difficult to understand and to manage. And, you know, in the past, we've said that small companies struggle with, for example, energy managers, because it's very hard to find people with the right skill sets. And of course, as we're now linking sustainability onto energy management, it's becoming a more and more complex job. And, and therefore, as you say, we need more and more skilled people coming out of universities. And universities need to be looking at, instead of just doing engineering degrees, for example, they should be looking at sustainability degrees. Yep. yep. That resonates well with David there. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And I'm just p picking up exactly on, on David's point. I think there was uh, there there is a clear move towards more more sustainability savvy boards. Um, there was a, a really a good paper from Hydrogen Struggles last week actually saying exactly this point. Um, the, the idea of linking profit with product with purpose, uh, and then building that into the strategy so that doing good and doing well go hand in hand you know and i think this is where that competitive nature of strategy impact is going to come from but i think there's a risk there's a wider risk as well so it's an opportunity but there's a risk of missing a moment um you know it, we, we we could be looking at companies that either dismiss this or set this aside as too costly or too complex to engage with uh, or too intimidating. Um, they could be heading the same way as Kodak and missing the impact of digital cameras or Blockbuster missing the impact of streaming and Netflix. You know, th th these are key industry drivers now. They're key consumer choice drivers and they're in key investment drivers as well. So complex or not is something we've got to engage together with for mutual partnerships, I think is the sort of phrase we, we find ourselves using quite a bit. Um, mutual partnerships between SMEs and enterprise level customers finding ways to um, 
educate upwards, if you like, because some of those SMEs have got some cracking innovations and the agility to move them quickly to market. And then the enterprise customers who've got that wider market reach and a different base to perhaps invest in that technology. So there is a, you know, like you say, possibly a once in a generation chance to get this right. And how much of that will require kind of joined up thinking from from kind of government, industry, education providers, whether that's schools, colleges, universities, uh, you know, organisations like Make UK. What what sort of role can Make UK play in this, Bridget? I think you're right. Uh, coordination, um, well, even just within the government department is one thing that we would like to see a bit more, um, which would really help. Um, so we're all looking forward to the um, net zero overarching strategy, we, we hope uh, that is to come, just to talk on net zero, but sustainability um, as a whole. Uh, and our role, I guess, is, um, yes, certainly, well, first of all, we are focusing ourselves on um, really educating and, and rallying our um, members for now. So, um, and then there are many of them who do ask us, um, you know, what can we do? Where can we find funding? Uh, and we uh, also, how can we collaborate? Uh, so that I think there's a lot of, um, there's a demand for symbiosis, industrial symbiosis, for example, you know, um, using one's waste um, as, heat for the other, <laughs> um, for example, but there are other, other circular economy as well, uh, opportunities a lot. And um, so, yes, I think we do have a role, but for Make UK, it's still early days. Um, we're, we're focusing on really, for now, this year, rallying um, our members towards uh, COP26 and um, getting them to, uh, well, they have to commit to um, the, the pledges or race to zero and so on, the campaigns. And then I think um, certainly after that, we will be, we are already trying to um, do this, but it's a little bit piecemeal. But yes, we will. Um, encourage collaboration and even amongst manufacturers themselves actually that's already starting and also partnerships with universities indeed but I think we can we we do have a role to amplify that a lot and you know I, we're ideally situated as well to do that yeah. absolutely yeah absolutely um you we, you spoke about um the the cop the cop summit that's coming up um towards the end of the year Obviously, being um, hosted by the UK in, in Glasgow, it's a it's a great chance to get um, the work being done in the UK on a on a kind of global stage when it comes to kind of net zero, sustainability, climate change in general. Really, um, how uh, David Picton, you spoke about a, a once in a generation um, opportunity to to kind of engage with with skills and, and engage with industry. How important is something like COP? Um, in terms of in terms of doing that and, and making making the most yeah of indeed Chris I, I think it, it's in, it's important I mean the, the issue is there and, and I think a lot will happen despite COP but I think it's a fantastic lightning rod to focus some of that thinking together um, it's a it's a perfect opportunity to focus on action though I think it's it's very easy to get distracted into words it is a complex agenda no I don't think it's worth simplifying anything there because people will miss the point with that complex agenda there, the important point is to generate action. Uh, and, and you made the point that, you know, can, can any one area achieve this? And, and, the, and the answer, of course, is no. It's an ecosystem of action. Uh, it, it's an ecosystem of mutual partnerships where people work together and learn from each other. Um, but you're right. I think the risk here is not um, in what we're trying to pursue. The risk is in not embracing it. Uh, that, that, that risk of missing that moment, missing the chance for skills development in, in investment in innovation. The great points we were making, Brigitte's points about skills, all three of us have said you know, about, about skills is that most of the impact of this and the way this is delivered post COP26 and into a low carbon decade ahead of us, most of it will be with people who haven't left school yet. Uh, using techniques and equipment that may not even have been invented yet. And there is so much to come that actually what we try to do is to lift this into an inspirational and exciting agenda. So, so use COP26 as a chance to inspire, engage and interest people so that it's not seen as a, a guilt agenda for a clipboard wielding snitches, shall we say, you know, but something actually that, that people want to get involved in, something that they, they want to become a part of. 
Absolutely, yeah. David, did that. Yeah, so I, <clears throat> I think it's key to understand that, you know, if, if the UK achieves its 2050 targets, we will not stop climate change going out of control. It needs the whole world to participate. And therefore, it's very important for us to not only be a world leader in helping other countries to achieve net zero, but also we need to ensure that the right mechanisms are in place so that if, if a country decides not to participate and to produce effectively very high carbon products, that that is reflected in the cost of imports, for example, or you know, to make sure there's, there's a levelization of carbon costs within all countries so that everybody's incentivized to do the carbon reductions. And, and similarly, things like carbon capture, for example, you know, when we talk about doing carbon capture in the UK, we know it's a very expensive product or process. And there's always the question about, is it cheaper to do it somewhere else? For example, you know, Iceland, yeah. where the, they have the right sort of geology potentially to make do carbon capture much cheaper. Is it more cost effective to build a plant in Iceland than it is in the UK? Uh, because ultimately it's the same CO2. It's global. <laughs> it's not, it's not a UK problem. So I think yeah. we need to look at the bigger picture into the international picture. That's a that's a very interesting point. Um, and actually, David, I'll stay with you um, very briefly. Um, David Picton um, spoke about how um, you know the, the next generation of, uh, of of people who'll be working in manufacturing or meeting these sustainability challenges, you know, will just be starting school or just be starting university, and and there's still a few years off um, entering the workforce and really starting to make a difference. Um, how far in advance should manufacturers be? Um, should manufacturers be coming up with a, su a sustainability action plan, for example, on a kind of individual site basis, whether you're a, a, a big multinational with sites all over the world or whether you're an SME with, with, one, with one factory in, in the Midlands, for example, how important is it to, to have a plan in place so that when these, these new, these, this, this kind of next generation of, of, of workers enter the workforce, um, they're ready to, to kind of essentially join the conveyor belt and, and carry on that sustainability um, sustainability journey? Well, certainly, you know, um, a lot of energy efficiency processes are about staff awareness, about people understanding why energy matters. And, uh, you know, people often say, OK, I can see waste on the ground or a you know, tin can. I know I can recycle that. But they don't really think about leaving the lights on as being wastage or producing carbon. So that sort of level of education needs to start at school. You know, they should be making people, well, I think I think it is happening. I, I don't have kids, so I, I don't really know what the <laughs> what's happening at the moment. But uh, but yeah, when you, you then look at things like apprenticeships, traditionally apprenticeships were about sort of uh, teaching people to make things. But why don't you have a sustainability apprentice in the future? You know, there, there's all those sort of opportunities available. Um, so yeah, it's gonna start from the ground up, you know, from, uh, from primary school onwards about the awareness of sustainability. Absolutely. And to be fair, also that this Absolutely. generation will also be the ones that are seeing more and more extreme weather events, and you know, and you know, the bushfires and the floods and so on. They're all going to be just commonplace to the next generation. Yeah, yeah. Bridget, is there anything? Uh, well, I just to wanted to say that um, we're going to have to. Industry is going to have to reduce its emissions by uh, two thirds by twenty thirty five, I believe. So yeah. that's a very or even before uh, more than that so um, 80 percent so it's a very very steep challenge so we can't ignore it so the sooner we start I mean we've got to start now literally we really have to start now so obviously until the policy landscape is um, not clear um, it's it's a little bit difficult but um, it's possible to do things obviously and uh, so there's uh, all the stuff around energy efficiency uh, but also changing, uh, you know, equipment, uh, which is part of it. So, yeah, there's a, a lot of things that can be done already. And having a plan is really important. Um, yeah, having EVs on, you know, on site and <laughs> that, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yes. Also, yeah, definitely. Sorry to interrupt. Can I also say it's, we need to understand at this point that not everybody is equal in terms of the scope of the challenge. If, if you're, for example, for example, in an industry that uses 95% of electricity and very little gas, then you can halve your electricity between now and 2030 by doing nothing because the grid is naturally decarbonizing. However, if you use 90% gas, you've got a problem. And that, that's the big challenge really for the next decade is gas. You know, trying to reduce sure. usage of gas, trying to replace it with other things. And, uh, you know, if you're in, for example, the ceramics industry, that's a pretty hard thing to do. 
Yeah. Yeah, just pick up pick up on David's point. I think it, it, it we often get asked the question, what you know, what can we what can we practically do? You know, it, it, as you said earlier on, it is a very complicated agenda. It can seem overwhelming. So we often talk about three different focus areas just to get started with. You know, the first would be energy. You know, where are you using it? Monitoring and prioritizing where you're using it, focusing on how you can cut usage. There will be absolutely ways that can be done and there'll be blind spots where you don't realize the energy leakage you've got and of course buying renewables or investing in renewables we, for you know we've just put uh, solar panels on the roof of our cardiff uh, main office for example you know so this this can be done at whatever level company you're at um so the e for energy that the p we talk about in terms of process you know redesigning processes or re-examining processes to, to edit out waste edit out travel um review the, the, the costs effectively the carbon costs that go into to that process because again there'll be blind spots within that process and the point we've made a couple of times is looking at your supply chain um, looking at the areas that are more carbon intensive uh, areas where you can perhaps go local uh, or even work, move it to off-site manufacturing but but looking at and working with supply chain partners so you've got epns and interestingly enough that eps earnings per share if you're an enterprise then perhaps that might just be a way of boosting the earnings per share as you go into these low carbon decades ahead of us Absolutely, that's a very good uh, kind of practical practical way of looking at what can be often quite a daunting a daunting um, subject for many, and, and kind of breaking it down into easily manageable um, manageable steps. Um, I'm I'm conscious of time and, and looking to to kind of finish up soon, so we'll we'll kind of end with one one final um, crystal ball question, if you like, um, and I'll come to to each of you in turn. You know, there's these ambitious. Um, targets of, of net zero by 2050. Uh, David Oliver, you said that even if the UK achieves it, it, it takes you know the whole world to uh, um, to, to really make a difference. Um, Bridget, you said you know we need to start acting now. There's COP coming up um, in in a few months. There's obviously the government's um, green rebuilding post pandemic um, agenda. How how realistic is it? Um, that all this is going to come together um, and 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 really, you know, make a difference. How how much of an impact is is everything that's going on at the moment um, likely to have um, on on kind of net zero and, and decarbonisation? And uh, Bridget, I'll come to you um, first, just to, just to kind of wrap up. Well, I think uh, we all have a role to play. There's, you know, it's been, it's quite clear that we as individuals, as businesses, as government, everybody, single person, you know, and business has uh, a role to play. So, um, you know, we've got to get going simply. And uh, I think the role of um, industry, as I said, there's a realistically, I'm, I think the COP has really, um, yeah, channeled a lot of energy and enthusiasm, and there is a lot of commitment. So hopefully, uh, you know, I'm I'm on I'm always positive, and I think you know you you need to take the first step to climb the mountain. So, um, and then you know, uh, you know how it it would have been in uh, inimaginable to think that you know plastic. Uh, bags would, uh, you know, would be made of compostable material nowadays or replaced by compostable plastic, uh, sorry, containers <laughs> um, just two years ago or three. So, um, you know, technology will follow, I'm sure, and will be surprised. Uh, so it is going to be very, a, a huge challenge, but um, I'm very hopeful uh, that we will achieve it. And um, David Oliver, I'll come to you. Yeah, I think if you go back 20 years and, you know, you were having the same call and people started saying, oh, in 20 years time, we're going to have less than half the carbon output from our power stations and we're going to have a massive infrastructure of mobile phone networks across the UK. People would have been doubtful, but it happened. And, you know, if you set the right market conditions, things will happen, they will improve. Uh, but obviously one of the key things we have to remember is, is costs and uh, I suppose one thing that's interesting is that uh, next month there'll be a call for evidence on industrial costs for energy. And I think, you know, that's going to be very important because we know that other European countries in particular, but also rivals like the USA, you know, they charge far less for energy for industry. And, you know, and if we don't have a fair sort of price for industry here, then we'll end up producing our products in countries where the carbon intensity is far, far higher 
and therefore there'll be a net increase in carbon in the in the world because we couldn't afford to make it here where we've got low carbon so that's that's the other part of the challenge is to actually make sure that we can only not only decarbonize but if, if, if anything grow industry in the uk to actually benefit from that Absolutely, that's a that's a very good point. And finally, David Picton, I'll come to you. Yeah, I think you're, I think I would echo uh, what Brigitte and David has said, or Bridget and Dave have, have, have brought out through the through the story as well. I, I think a couple of points just finally to make are that, that we can only do this together as an ecosystem. So I, I, whether you're a big player or you want to play with the big players, I think the the impetus is equally there, and we've got to to act together to to make it happen. Um, and I think we've got to measure it bit by bit as well it, you know it, it is something that will happen incrementally it won't happen all at once and if you look at the entire slope that you've got to, to ski down if you like you, you, you'd never ski it so 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 I think you just look at it piece by piece really measure it piece by piece and um, and, and track and get data out of um, C drives and Excel spreadsheets you know get them into systems that, where you can actually make intelligent decisions based on them and focus on the areas that are most carbon intensive. Um, uh, the, the analogy where we smile at is that you don't go on a diet and then weigh yourself twice a year uh, and expect to lose weight. You know, you, you, you weigh on a regular basis. So that's what we've got to do. We've got to weigh the cost and the weight of this carbon on a regular basis and act on a regular basis and bit by bit together with mutual partnerships. I think we can get there. Um, if I Sorry. just may add one point, I think the action at international level, of course, is key. So, uh, and the UK has a major role to play, as we said before. Yeah, absolutely. And as as we've as we've said during this panel, you know, the UK has a chance to to really take the lead here and 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 show the rest of the world that it can be done. And and as David uh, Picton just said there, you know, it, it it might look like a an insurmountable mountain at the moment, but if you break it down, and each each country, each business, and then each individual within the country does their bit, then um, I'm, I'm I'm equally confident that we can certainly start to see see a major a major difference happening um, sooner rather than later hopefully because it it does need to happen as people have said it, it's a kind of an immediate problem and, and one that uh, isn't going to go anywhere so um yeah uh, there's no joke about how, how do you eat an elephant hmm. And the answer is one mouthful at a time. One mouthful yeah. at a time. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, and it is true you know uh, the realities are with different um different music coming out of uh, america now different wording coming out of china now you know the the these big international plays are, are setting a condition that when we were in paris in 2015 you know those those conditions were different uh, the conditions are changing so with the with, you know with the big moves from those international players there's there's a real chance here Absolutely. Yeah, that's a, a great positive note um, note to end on. Um, thank you to Bridget, to David and to the other David um, for your time today. Uh, thank you to everyone who's, who's tuned in to watch um, and I'll hopefully see you again soon. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Thanks, Chris. Chris.